Hi everyone, my name is Elena. I am here appearing as a light-skinned Filipinex woman with short dark curly hair. I have glasses and a very thick Icelandic sweater because it is cold here in Sheffield, England. And my pronouns are she, her. I am here mostly representing my latest podcast, Massively Disabled, which is a long COVID research podcast. I will pass the mic to Dieter. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Dieter. Uh, I'm a white man. I've got brown hair. I've just had a haircut, so I like to think it, it looks pretty snazzy. Um, and I've got, um, <laughs> in the background, you'll see a, a tenement style flat in, in Glasgow where I, where I live and work at the University of Glasgow. And Ian, I'll hand over to you. Uh, really, uh, my name's uh, Ian Savro. I'm a uh, very middle-aged uh, white man with graying hair that looks mercifully brown under this light. Um, also in Sheffield, um, like everybody else over here in Britain right now, wearing something warm. Um, I'm going to guess it's no better in, in bits of the States, but it's a bit cold. And I would say good morning or good afternoon. It's good afternoon for us from wherever you're on. I'm a, a retired university academic and NHS uh, consultant and together with Dieter have been running a podcast called Conversations in Arts, Health and Humanities uh, since the beginning of COVID. Here is sweet baby that. I'm sorry? Oh, that was unintentional. Uh, all right, so I am responsible for bringing everyone here today, because I've been thinking a lot about research ethics and accountability in podcasting. And I thought the HPN would be a great place to really talk through some of these ideas with you all. So Ian, Dieter and I are very much not here to speak at you necessarily, but to speak to each other and then bring you in. So we'll have a few questions that maybe we'll post to you before we break. Uh, and so while we have like a five minute break later, you can reflect on those questions if you want and come back to us. I also want to say, yes, feel free to put your questions in the chat as we go, just if you don't want to forget them, but uh, we'll be very happy for you to unmute yourselves and turn on your cameras if you would like at the end during the question period. So. We wanted to start with having a discussion about kind of the positive academic and ethical motivations for why we wanted to talk about this as people who are in or around academia and none of us do podcasting as our primary form of scholarship, but some of us dip into it uh, at different levels and we all have different experiences of what this looks like and there are for sure some challenges but before we get to those we wanted to kind of talk about why we think this is important to think about ethics and accountability including research ethics but not only so i'll, I'll start with dieter um why do you want to talk about ethics and podcasting I think it's important to talk about ethics in podcasting um, because podcasting has the ability to be very inclusive as a, as a practice and it can bring people into an academic dialogue who might not be trained academics. And I think that's that's part of the beauty of the medium. But at the same time, it, it means that we, as people who do research, who work at universities, might not all, always know also what the procedures are. If you do if you do a study and you work with human participants, you know that you need to go through an ethics application at your institution. But if you're interviewing or you know hosting people on a podcast, you're not really doing research about those people, typically. Um, and it can be difficult to know on an institutional level, what the ethics are that needs to be that need to be put in place. And I think it's important to talk about that because otherwise I feel podcasting remains in this kind of gray zone where universities don't really know what to do with it. And if they don't really know what to do with it, they might not really value it as well, which then might be less of an incentive for researchers to keep putting time into this medium, which can bring people in and can be a form of um, inclusivity. So so that one of the reasons I think I would want to talk about it today. 
Yeah, I agree. This idea of like making it legible to the university, because obviously it's still labor <laughs> to put into this. Um, and if we want to be using it in teaching or as resources, then yes, having it valued by the university is important. Um, Ian, do you have anything you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I came, I mean, for, for Dieter and I, we set up conversations in arts, health and humanities. I mean, I was a frontline physician during COVID. And um, Dieter and I were talking based on a, converse, on a conference that he had run and we wanted to continue working together and wanted to do something positive at a time that not much felt very positive. Um, and for us, we conceived this as a dissemination exercise and we thought very carefully about how we constructed our podcast to find, enthuse, encourage, disseminate knowledge around medical humanities, lead, you know, interview people who are leaders in the field and, and create a positive space that was an exciting space to share something good at a time when the world was not good. Um, but I come from a background where almost everything feels incredibly regulated as a physician. You know, I spent my whole life surrounded by duties of care and confidentiality. Um, and um, as a researching academic, I spent my whole life thinking very carefully about what could possibly be conceived as research in order to make sure I never fell either foul of procedures that might catch me out if I didn't know they were there or also that I simply acted appropriately and acted, you know, a, as a good citizen, as a good human being. And so Dieter and I had long conversations about, you know, how our podcast should work. And effectively, I think we applied the old philosophical golden rule. Um, do unto others as you would have done to yourself and don't do unto others something that you wouldn't want done to you. Um, and we thought quite hard about it. But as time has gone on, and the last few years have passed, we've begun to see that there are many ethical dimensions to the bringing together of people to share knowledge and ideas, to put out words that are there potentially permanently, and that are amenable to editing and that need responsible handling, and that can involve so many different sorts of participants, whether academics or whether you interview people who have lived experience or are there to represent um, a, you know, an illness experience, a life experience, or, or, or or a group of citizens from which they're from. And all of these things generate genuine dilemmas about what actually does good practice look like? And it felt really worthwhile to actually have that discussion because it, I, I, it's very hard to find guidelines and it's very hard to find academic guidelines. It's very hard to find any guidelines from our organizations about actually what does good practice really look like? And that's also why I thought it would be interesting to bring the three of us here in conversation, because I come from philosophy, Dieter, correct me if I'm wrong, you come from film studies. Um, and Ian, you were a clinician for a long time and you came into medical humanities at a later part of your career. Um, so we all identify as working within the scope of medical humanities, but we come from very different methodological practices. Uh, theoretical practices and protocols. And I think it's important for us, like even if this is a humanities podcast network, all the humanities are not the same. And people also work within the humanities having different kind of trainings and understandings of the world and understanding of what research is and what ethics are. So these concepts like research and ethics and even podcasting are things that we use interchangeably and we assume a common understanding. But really, when you dig into it, uh, it gets a bit more complicated. So, for example, I find that there is an inherent tension between wanting to have protocols and have guidelines that maybe ensure a more overall ethical practice across the industry, at least insofar as like scholars are doing it and really taking away what podcasting can do about kind of experimenting about bringing different voices to the table by creating bureaucracy around how we proceed with podcasting so i don't have any answers for any of you i'm sorry to say but i do think there is this tension because I think everyone in this virtual room will agree that we do podcasting, we consume podcasts because they create a different way of expressing 
ourselves and ex even expressing ourselves professionally. And so, yes, I do think there is a tension between wanting to preserve that and also saying maybe we should have guidelines. And just to be clear also, we're all three of us are representing kind of the UK framework. So it might be interesting if people are here from around the world to maybe the realities of your academic systems means that your guidelines might be slightly different. So we don't want to be prescriptive in that, but we are very much thinking from within the British Academy, even like Scotland and England are slightly different, but we'll see. <laughs> so Dieter and Ian, you both worked on conversations, um, but Dieter, you've also since then co-produced another podcast. Could you talk about that and maybe what kind of values or moral positions arose when you were thinking about that? Oh yeah, definitely. Maybe, um, Ian, do you want to talk maybe a little, sort of like some of the values maybe behind conversations and what we wanted to achieve with that? And then I can talk a little bit about mm. autistic counter stories. And I think there were differences in sort of the ethics of both um, series that I think might be interesting to tease out a little bit. Yeah, I mean, Conversations was, I think, conceived as a fairly straightforward attempt to bring medical humanities to a wider audience in a way that was interesting and engaging. And we wanted it to be light touch and, and, and feel very much like a living conversation because we felt that we wanted to reclaim this idea of conversation as an important part of academic work. Um, so we would do, uh, we did live Zoom webinars, which we recorded and released with minimal editing. Um, and um, for those, we reflected carefully on how we would want to be treated and what was the right way of making sure that people were respected as participants in their knowledge. So, so we thought carefully about whom we recruited and there were strong angles around who we should be asking to um, participate. So we looked very carefully at our inclusivity and aspects of social justice in terms of making sure that um, we reached out across the world, um, that we represented um, uh, different ethnicities, different educational uh, groups and values, um, and tried very hard to be broad in those in in inclusions. Um, we would then make sure that we um, pre-interviewed with people to work out exactly which bits of their work we were going to discuss and how we were going to do it. Um, in order to make sure that you know people had no surprises, though to be fair, the conversations would still wander off on tangents. Uh, and then we worked very carefully uh, with minimal editing to allow people to listen back to the conversations in order prior to release, in order to be clear that they knew what they had said and that they were comfortable with their phrasing, and make sure that everything was was straightforward before it was released. Thus producing something that was truly collaborative and interesting and generated, um, you know, a, a really valuable discussion. Um, um, but, you know, obviously worked to be inclusive and to um, uh, properly respect the contributions of, of, of all of our participants. Yeah, and I think, um, so we were thinking about consent and, you know, informed consent and giving people the, you know, people knew what they were going to do. There was a pre-meeting, then there were, was a live webinar, which then gets produced into a podcast, and then people get to listen to that before it goes out again. And for us, that was really important to give people that opportunity. Um, but the process by which we're we're doing that is, you know, email. You know, consent gets logged via email. It's almost like it's sort of like an an honor system. And Ian checked in with with your institution. You know, do we need to? apply for formal ethics when we're doing this? And the answer was no. Um, I think it's in that respect similar to maybe an event like today or another kind of academic talk or academic conference which gets recorded and gets put out there. Typically, it's not something that an institution would consider it necessary to go through, you know, a, an ethics procedure because you're working with you and participants. Um, I ended up doing a, a, a mini podcast series called Autistic Counter Stories, which was trying to represent uh, perspectives around autism, had um, contributions from, from lots of autistic participants and lots of autistic participants who were not academics. And the procedures that we followed in, in order for 
you know, making sure that people gave informed consent were very similar to what we we're doing at conversations, you know, pre-meeting. It wasn't it wasn't live. So that was the difference. So everything was it was just a straightforward podcast. But people got to listen to it before um it went out and it got signed off. So in that respect, the procedure was very similar. But one major difference was that I felt like okay, we are now going to work with people outside of academia. I need to go back to my ethics board and ask them. And so was at a previous institution. But I think it would be similar at other institutions in the, UK, in the UK from what I hear. It's not quite sure what to do with it. And so at first I heard, no, you don't have to go through ethics. And then, oh, yes, you do. Um, and then I needed to work within a form that's all about doing research with human participants, but it's really research about human participants. And it was asking me all of these questions about you know, what, what's the research question and what's, um, you know, it was all about research and it, it didn't feel like what we were trying to do with the podcast was easily addressed in the form. So I constantly said, my, as I've said before, you know, what we're trying to do is this. And so I needed to answer all of these questions, but the form wasn't set up for it. And went back and forth and it went back and forth a couple of times. And then it's when I really realized that um, there is at least in, in the UK and from, from what I hear at other institutions as well in the UK, that if you want to do a podcast project that is not just a bunch of academics talking to each other, and it requires a form of, more formal overview that the forms aren't aren't set up to accommodate that and the result of that was that it was really difficult to get this project across the line that was trying to get people people's perspective represented in an academic dialogue who otherwise find it difficult to be represented and we're now trying to write a co-authored article together about the podcast series and we've we've sent it out to every participant and and there's quite a few participants that have come back to say that I was happy to participate in the podcast but doing a peer review journal article is not something that I've got time or inclination to contribute to and I think that goes back to the the point I was trying to make earlier as well that it does afford people from all sorts of um different backgrounds who may not have academic training to be part of an academic conversation in a way that, for example, a journal article doesn't. And that's why I think it's important to have these institutional procedures in place that can make it easy. Um, I think in our pre-meeting, you talked about sort of the the positive ethics. You know, it's not about not doing harm, but also facilitating something good. Um, and so I think having clear clearer structures and procedures from an institutional point of view, I think would be helpful there. Yeah, I agree, because I think I share very much this idea of like, I don't want to do unto others something that I wouldn't want to happen to myself. But for me, that came from a perspective of being a disabled academic and being a philosopher of disability. So I don't really get to choose necessarily cleanly which hat I wear when um and i wanted to use podcasting to challenge that so i really wanted to have people on the podcast who have lived experience of long covid and are not academics uh, but also people who are academics including people who work in public health who have long covid to really push against this idea that there's either people who are sick and disabled and then people who work in academia and that the the never the twain shall meet and this idea of the way i would want to be treated is as though like my knowledge is as valid whether i have my academic hat on or not and i think the university has a hard time thinking about kind of radical equality of who is is talking and i think 
podcasting can help us do that. And for context, when I produced Massively Disabled, I did use my research budget. It was like fully sanctioned by my university. But when I approached them, I was working at the time as a bioethicist in a faculty of medicine. They were like, how many rats will you sacrifice? And I was like, well, none. Um, and the ethics procedure was like, not at all uh, set up for it. So they kind of like, well, I guess it's fine. You're just talking to people. <laughs> uh, which if I had been in a social science department, they might've been like, no, that is not fine. Uh, so again, it was very context dependent, um, but I think I benefited by the fact that people saw, oh, I don't know what this is, go for it. But other people might be like, I don't know what this is. I'm scared, don't do it. And then it would not have been made. So again, talking about having guidelines and having terms and procedures that more people can understand who are maybe not as familiar with podcasting, that is something that's useful so that we don't always land at the mercy of who is like willing to give you the green light in whatever context. I think this is a good moment for us to pivot to maybe some of the challenges that we have faced and questions that we might still have. Um, this goes along quite well with what we were just talking about. So if there were no none of these guidelines, did you formalize for yourselves? Did you ever write it down, Dieter and Ian? Like, do you have a document for either or both of your podcasts where you put your ideas down as a kind of legacy document, for example? I mean, we didn't at the start and we haven't done yet. And I really wish and I really feel that now probably we should. And I mean, when we came to it, we conceived a series of live webinars that would bridge a COVID time and that we might then release as a podcast because we thought people would find enjoyment listening to them. And we discussed very clearly our ethics and our our personal codes of conduct, and we made those reasonably explicit in our conversations with our um, participants, um, at least in as much as demonstrating clear respect for them and, and their knowledge and their ideas and ensuring that we represented them well and that they got to say what they wanted to say. Um, but we were novices. And there's no, you know, I mean, maybe there is now, maybe if I did a search on how to do a podcast, you'd probably find a million articles through Google. Um, but when we were doing this, you know, even just, at, you know, 2020, it, it felt like quite a new thing to do. And we didn't have role models and we didn't know who we could ask. And also we were pretty submerged with 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 other worlds. Um, so I think what I would, you know, one thing that we should do for our next series is just for our own sake and just to be able to show it is actually come up with a kind of broad statement of principles. These are the principles for the podcast, its aims, its objectives, um, its its ways of acting and its ways of being respectful. Um, and that would be something that I think could be on our podcast webpage as well. I don't think that should just be for the participants, but also for the audience to, to see where we're coming from. Um, I mean, you know, it would be, different i guess if we we're trying to create something that would challenge expected ideals by deliberately being generating confrontation which is not not as has not been our aim or objective um but i i think it, i think there's no harm in formalizing what one thinks and having a, a demonstration that one's considered the di dimensions of what one does and i i think we should probably do it and of course the thing is as everything that you evolve organically over many years, you look back and think, I would have done it differently then. Um, but then I was not the person I am now. I think it's a process of constant reflection, I imagine. Um, and I think even if you had some guidelines, you would probably want to continue reflecting. And so you can have a project a research project with you and participants and it's gone through ethics at your institution and it's got ethical approval but that doesn't necessarily mean it's moral you know in in what it what it does you know and you know i think it's important when we are having this discussion about ethics and i think we need potentially as a community you know can do some work around evolving towards some frameworks or some protocols that help universities make sense of the type of 
activity that podcasting is so that we ensure that it gets valued within the academy but at the same time i i it's the work is not done and i and i think especially because it that spontaneous encounter that podcasts are very good at moments can emerge that you might not plan for um we we um we had a podcast about death and dying which was a webinar live webinar um at the moment the queen died and, and um the audience was starting to ask um questions about this to our guests uh so you can't really i guess plan for for things like that um in advance that kind of spontaneity i also just wanted to pick up on what you're saying about the different hats and again i think it speaks to this um climate of we're not quite sure with podcasts so with autistic counter stories like we on, on conversations we've had openly autistic and neurodivergent researchers and they have spoken about their personal lives or maybe even how their neurodivergence intersects with their academic work um but it's it's commonly accepted that you know we didn't need an, an, an a signature from them to give their consent but the same person who participated in autistic counter stories if we have you had people there who were academics as well um then did have to go through that formal consent and it it felt like in both instances um we were doing a type of practice that still doesn't feel fully recognized by you know the institutions if you write a journal article you know what to do um so i think I'm, i might be hitting the, the same nail a bit but what you were saying about the two hats reminded me of that yeah and this is i think this is a good place for me to shout out the critical design lab at vanderbilt university and they have for example protocols for crip podcasting so they have done that they have done the work of like actually writing down like how do we design protocol what are our aims what are our objectives he's there here are our practices so i think i mean i this encourages me to seek out maybe what already exists because people have been doing this um and then maybe even there are some people in the room who have been mapping this out and i would be really curious to hear about that later but i just wanted to signal boost like this was written by amy hamray jaramush Kevin Gotkin, Kelsey Acton, and Josh Halstead. And they have lots of other protocols there. But yeah, we are thinking about this, but it's always heartening to see that other people are doing so as well. And another question I had for us is podcasting kind of exists in a journalism adjacent space as well like some podcasts are like clearly for entertainment but they'll cover still cover on like ongoing news and things like that or pop culture and have like an analysis and things and i think when we are talking about dissemination and we're talking about having these conversations on air with lots of different people it kind of veers into the territory of journalism and so i'm wondering like did any of you have knowledge of journalistic ethics before you embarked on your podcasting adventures did you encounter journalism ethics as you worked and do you think that we should even consider that framework at all mm -hmm. as uh academic podcasters yeah i'm happy to say something about it and that was uh it, it's been so interesting you know working with ian and doing the podcast uh, in a very kind of academic fashion. And then Autistic Counter Stories was a production with Elena Di Comites from Studio De Noc in, in Belgium, because it was um, a project associated with the university in Belgium. And Elena's a trained journalist. And so when she makes her podcasts, her ethical reflection comes from a journalistic training. And we had a couple of moments in that podcasting process where we were making decisions about doing particular things in the edit or not so i give you one example was um 
we had wanted to add something that didn't that wasn't recorded in the moment and we could have just recorded it afterwards and then elena's journalistic ethics kicked in and say no because we we're actually trying to create a story that gives the impression to the listener that this happened in real time and it was really interesting to see that elena had this robust framework of ethics or kind of professional code that she could fall back on that in that instance you know it made it very clear and easy for us to make um, particular kind of decisions and other decisions that we know okay we're going to leave this in for x y and z and if somebody asks us about it then we will say well okay we're we, we kept this in for this and this reason and that's sort of part of the ethics so in that respect, that was really helpful. At the same time, and I think Elena, you've you've talked about this before when we we spoke. Like as a journalist, consent works quite differently, right? You can uh, get a story about somebody out there, um, so that might not be the best practice that we want to adhere to. But to wrap up my thought, I I did feel like working with somebody who had journalistic training and had done quite a few podcasts with that from within that framework, they felt like they had robust ethical frameworks that they could fall back on. And I know, know that we as researchers have robust ethical frameworks that we can fall back on when we do research, but I don't yet think that we have them in the same way from when we do uh, podcasting. And I guess it's kind of interesting that we get um, training sometimes, you know, universities may offer us training in outreach. We can be encouraged to do participatory events in our communities to share knowledge. You know, in our university, it might be talking about your PhD in a pub, or it might be um, National Science Week, um, or, you know, it could be participating in media outreach, you know, responding to media queries about your work and your publications, and you may get trained in putting your best foot forward and part of you know the university is very keen on podcasts it's got a hub it likes the idea that we're going to share our knowledge and be enthusiastic because we should you know what we do is great and it's really interesting and it's lovely to tell people about it um but nobody ever says for um any of these things actually they you know what what are the standards and actually i don't know i i don't know where the standards start and stop in the same way that you know if, I, if i've been out in our local town centre doing work sharing stories that um about research or about things that the patients have, have told me about people's illness and, and to inspire and communicate um they 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 come with you know you, they come with the same sorts of issues in a way podcasting it's just that podcasting goes out on the web and it's there forever and you've got the uh, issues of editing it and what's the right edit what reflects truth I mean, for us doing a live webinar, our edits were light and minimal because we wanted to capture the conversation uh, rather than produce something that was incredibly slick and could be on national public radio. Um, and so, you know, all of these things, you know, actually the, the dimensions of good ethical practice in part in in dissemination of what we do, I think, is also broader than just podcasting. And that pivots quite nicely into my last question for you, which is if you dreamed up academic podcasting guidelines, what count, kinds of accountability would you want to integrate? If, if you didn't just have to maybe reform existing research ethics protocols, but you thought about guidelines that you could then present to the university, what are the different kinds of accountability you would want to take on board? I think one important principle of being a host is being a good host to your guests, I think, and making sure that what you're doing serves sort of what your your guests want to do. And when I was putting the ethics proposal for autistic counter stories um together, the the university was 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 worried about you know, autistic people coming on to the podcast and, and issues around consent and issues that are scared of doing harm. And I, and I so we had to have, have this uh, participant information sheet 
and there's a consent form with like seven boxes that people would tick and it would be like you know this recording will go out onto to online and it will you know be, go beyond the university and people might respond and one participant yeah i know how the internet works yes yes i know i know how the internet works as well so it felt like we were doing um a kind of labor that wasn't really serving the needs of our of our guests who um you know had decided that they wanted to come and participate in this and, and sort of give a space to perspective that otherwise not might not be part of the conversation. And, and I guess part of the worry there in the background is that if we're bombarding people with participant information sheets and these um, elaborate consent forms and then signing, and yeah, because that happened, like, you know, it needed to be signed and we were working with, with some neurodivergent people and, and that added extra layers of stress and it almost meant that people were at the verge of dropping out. Um, so I think yeah, making sure that what you're doing serves the needs of your guests and for the institution to to acknowledge that um, would, for me, be very important. I would love to see a series of clear questions um, along the lines of demonstrating that you have considered aspects of your podcast, its primary purpose. Um, how it is how you can ensure that it's transparent in in what it does um its positive values and what it's seeking to achieve um how it you know might mitigate any issues of um bias or or risks of excluding people um and then to consider whether there are any any risks that need mitigation um so I mean they could just they they could be as simple as somebody completely misphrases something that was that they wanted to say clearly and said in the wrong way at the time and would wish to have chosen to remove in an edit because it just didn't represent their their beliefs at the time or the way they wanted to describe what they did or or you know or or it could be risk to participants in terms of feeling scared or 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 however or whatever it might be. Um and an acknowledgement that the words are potentially out there on, on the internet forever. So I think that we 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 should have an, 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 at the very minimum a series of simple questions to ask ourselves that we can go through clarity. And you could put them on our website on you know as part of your podcast dissemination. This is the values of this particular podcast, um, and I think that'd be a really lovely thing to do, um, and would, would be a very positive step forward at the very least. Yeah, I, I agree. And as you were talking, it made me think, you know, when we do a how to start a podcast and what's available kind of in general on the internet for people who want to start a podcast for their own reasons, um, you know, identifying audience, identifying tone, identifying structure, are all important things. And I think what you're describing, Ian, would fit quite nicely in something that already exists when you like who is your audience and so that was like what is the aim of this podcast what are you trying to do um what kind of community are you trying to build that will involve like your values it will involve the tone it will involve how you choose to engage with your guests and i think it's always important to keep in mind that all academic podcasting exists exists within the broader ecosystem of an industry, um, which is for better or worse, uh, you know, capitalistic and will be emphasizing growth and will relatability or like a broader audience and marketability for certain things. And I think what's, if it's not too naive to say, it would, is kind of special about having an academic podcasting sphere and hopefully paid labor around academic podcasting is that we don't need necessarily to map onto that we can really reflect and think okay if the aim is not just to reach the most people possible but it is to cultivate a certain kind of ethos within our podcast and how do we go about that and so it would be yeah not cripping because it's not everyone will do disability stuff but like taking the like challenging the industry template of the questions you ask yourself when you build your podcast and like 
it's not just doing something different. It's like within that, how do you take into account all these ethical considerations? And I think it probably goes goes back to if you're, I guess, have the good fortune to be able to work from within an institutional framework, from within academia, um, you know, what, what gets valued and why um, it, get, it gets valued, I think is is important. So, you know, is it about reaching the broadest possible audience or are there other ways in which the work that you're doing can be very valuable? How make all is accessible as well is really important because um, I, every organisation that we belong to will have endless pages of codes of conduct and protocols and, and things in place that you need to, that sometimes may be there, but you need to know to go look for it. And when Dieter and I started podcasting from the very innocent uh, times of 2020, you know, it probably wouldn't have occurred to us to go looking for this kind of information because we simply didn't know it was out there. So it's hard to go looking for stuff that you don't know exists. And it's very easy to teach students and anybody coming through a university or an academic background that anything that you do is research needs careful consideration for the possibility of research ethics. And certainly all of our students are... You know, this is this is a really live conversation at every possible opportunity. Does this need ethics? Do you need a procedure for this? Um, but if you're doing something new where it's clearly not research as defined by standard definitions and stuff, actually it's quite hard to know where to go to look for to ensure that you're actually starting to, to do these things. And you've also got to know to go to look because you might just start to experiment and dabble and and, and release a recording without having... With, without having any of this come come through and um how do you know that the stuff is there to see i think that's also quite an important question and this we're gonna go through not all of them because we don't have time but maybe like one question that we will also be sharing with you the audience so we'll talk for another about five minutes and then we'll take a five minute break but i'll put the questions in the chat so that you can follow along and or reflect on them if you want to during the break. But I think I'll just pick one. I'll take my chair's privilege. What is research and what is dissemination in podcasting? Go. Uh, that's such a big question. And it's a question that we've been talking about quite a lot because we're trying to set up a a project together where we would you know have a database that centralizes and categorizes podcasting work in the medical and health humanities the field that we work in but also create a kind of space where we might create some protocols or do exactly the type of work that we're doing here today and we need to we need to present it to the funder and it it might not be it's it's not sort of research in the classical sense and i think ian is very helpful in bringing us back to that constantly and I think it's important it's what I did as well when I got autistic conversations through through ethics I was like it's not research it's something else um but at the same time the the danger might be that if it's not research it gets devalued as a kind of academic practice and in the UK we have this distinction between scholarship and research where research is creating new things and and scholarship is, is keeping up to date with what's already out there. And that has real consequences because people are on research contracts or scholarship contracts. And scholarship contracts can be a way of kind of um, limiting, I guess, the, the time that you are paid to actually do research, but we're calling it a scholarship. So I think it's important that we have this conversation about the different because not all podcasts are the same as well. I think there are differences, but to have this conversation, and I don't know what the answer is, but I do think it's an it's an important one, and it, it has to do with um how these things are being valued. That's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because as as academics who are required to show to our institutions that the work that we do has value and brings in value. 
I mean, the very act of disseminating our work is important and is valued. Um, and, you know, our universities and institutions will broadly on the whole be very supportive of this, but it, it may not contribute to other hard measures that they might be interested in, like grant funding or, or, or raising more money. Um, and therefore, it can be tempting to try and label things as research to make them fit into an academic target, a percentage of your time or, or however, however we're measured. Um, which will vary from institution to institution about what's deemed to be of value and, and also from field of study to field of study, as, as you said earlier, Elena. Um, but the act of labelling it as research also then creates you know, a requirement appropriately to make sure that it fits in with ethical mm -hmm. standards. I mean, for me, research is this is the generation of new knowledge and its analysis, the creation in a way of something that you could at some level call data with a view to its public dissemination. And those features are, are what makes research. And for me, it's certainly all the podcasting I participated in is, is clearly not that. It's, it's the sharing of knowledge for the joy, the interest for the creation of excitement around a field for inspiring others to take part for raising interesting questions and leaving others feeling like they have gained a new understanding in themselves from hearing from experts in the field of death and dying or racial justice in academia or narrative medicine or um, what medical humanities looks like in Africa or, or, or in China and so forth. And all of these things are, you know, it, are really valuable but they they for me are, are not research so um for me it feels reasonably easy to say what's research and what's not but every now and again you have to make sure that you don't find somebody else has got a protocol that says oh no that is all recent research and does or doesn't need to then you have someone wrong. like me who is like i will use crypistemologies and be like the research i do as part of producing the podcast is part of the research that i then cite later and do all sorts of weird things but um we can talk about that more later if people want to ask questions but it's I, time I for a break that, i love that the boundaries blur because it it makes us really think about it and actually i i'd be really interested in what the audience think um, absolutely so right now we will take five minutes until i believe in eastern standard time is will be eleven twenty-five. it will be 425 here in the UK. Please stretch, hydrate, think about the questions or don't, and I'll see you back in about four minutes now. Sounds perfect. Thank you all so much. Nice to see some people still with us. Hello, everybody. Yeah. If I had one wish as a podcaster, it's that I could learn some good DJing skills to fill in those empty spaces. <laughs> All right. Welcome, everybody, on this Luck. warm, sunny day from... <laughs> from not sunny Sheffield. Yeah, go. Uh, for, for those of you that are not in the UK, we've been stuck under some ghastly, foggy, high pressure. And none of us has seen sunlight for something like 15 days now. And we're all, we're all getting a bit British academic winter depressed. So thank you everyone for coming back. Um, just for accessibility, I'm going to read out some of the things that were in the chat. So we have two messages from Rebecca. I relate deeply to what Elena is saying about podcasting offering a different mode of expression than is typically seen in academic context. Working with voice audio was a breath of fresh air in between thesis writing, teaching and grading when I was working towards my MA. I feel exactly the same. Rebecca continues, would love to hear during q &A, any tips for assembling a board of ethics? Yes, we also would love to hear that. With Dieter's example, producing counter stories from the autistic community beyond the university, I can imagine there were a lot of different stakeholders to bring in. How do you find the right number and composition of people to serve as a board of ethics members consultants? Excellent question. 
Nick says, journalistic ethics are a helpful starting place because a lot of the principles concern interpersonal interactions, like conversations and interviews, and how to treat recorded speech. But podcasts go a bit beyond sometimes, and the framework won't help us create the important point of how podcasts as projects should be measured or treated in the academy when done as extracurricular research. And I'll just go quickly over the questions if people want to address those. So how much of podcasting ethics is negative? For example, refraining from unethical behavior versus positive. For example, giving voice to concepts, increasing justice, identifying and combating injustice. Do any of you work in institutions where there are policies for podcasting and or associated ethics? And what was your experience with that? Has anyone had specific experiences of following ethical codes of conduct? Or do you think there are national differences in how we approach regulation and conduct as well? And if you would like to chime in on what is research and what is dissemination? Again, please uh, feel free to type in the chat. I will read them out loud, and but also unmute and turn on your cameras if the spirit so moves you. Alea, do, do you want us to, to speak to any of these questions? Sure, yeah, go ahead. I would love to, this idea of putting together this working group to continue this kind of thinking. And it's something that, uh, that we're going to do. So if anybody here today is interested in that, I would just say you can, you can drop us a line and and I think one of the, the things that I took with me in the break, I think Ian, you articulated something really very well about trying to shoehorn practices that might not really be research into this category of research, just so that they would become legible and understandable. But I think one of the things that we have been talking about is if something is research, it comes with particular kinds of demands for ethics that might not be the right kinds of demands when you're when you're doing podcasting and thinking then maybe about the conversation series that we've we've done which is essentially by researchers for researchers and when you go to a conference and you speak to the uh, keynote speaker and they give you lots of career advice but if you're not sitting at that side of the table you don't get to hear that i think that's the type of conversation that we wanted to recreate and it's maybe sort of like the grease that makes i we talk a lot about imposter syndrome and it's really quite helpful, I think, when you've got very established academics say, I feel like an imposter. And my hope is that somebody will listen to that, think, oh, I might belong anyway. And I feel like that does some kind of work towards a research culture, but it's probably indeed not um, research. But I think a need to articulate that as an academic community. And I think because podcasting is probably something you want to have as part of what we do. So does anybody else actually, I mean, do, do our audience feel that we are asking certain questions of ourselves or if other people just moved on past them in different ways or found institutions that do or don't have approaches? I mean, does do these questions chime for those that are listening or or do you find yourself wondering whether we're trying to make mountains out of molehills or or um, molehills out of mountains? I, I'm very simulated. I, I'll be I'll be brave and unmute. No, I, I think these are all Thank really you. pertinent, uh, like interesting questions that are extremely relevant for the things. I'll say that as I've like done things or worked with part of my work as I work with other people that are doing podcasts and yeah, we do talk about like what ethical concerns they might have and what they might need to address. Um, for instance, like even people who do fiction podcasts and people who do voices, there's now a lot of questions around like representation within 
uh, the voice acting community and people representing like the particular accents and things that are doing as, as opposed to like uh, actors and other things doing. So those are questions that you have and that you might need to address to your audience. But um, one thing that I, I was just going to suggest, maybe I'm also a philosopher. And so sorry for doing the philosopher's move where I go, let's do a gentle reframing of the first question, because one uh, thing that comes up for us, especially when we're talking best practices, is we do often really want to talk about like, what is what is the like positive or negative or like, how do you do this? Maybe I think a, a better question, especially within more common, like applied ethical frameworks is what is permissible? What's what, what are we looking at uh, in terms of like what uh, there's there might be a lot of ways to accomplish um, these kind of different things. And so uh, you might have a, different kinds of principles that that do recommend that like, well, yeah, there's a lot of different actions that are permissible to a, a particular degree. Um, and how you do that, that's really what I think most other professional societies and other things work towards when they want to make um, not just statements of value, but statements about like what should be internal behaviors of our professional organization be um, and what, what should those guiding principles be. And so that might be a, another way of looking at it in terms of like, what is permissible, impermissible, and like uh, what is right and wrong, uh, you know, ultimately. Um, but yeah, that's that's maybe just a thought. Thanks for that. Um, that was really helpful and a nice way of framing it. Uh, one of these things is how do we disseminate these things so that somebody who suddenly says, I'm going to start a podcast, knows how to find the information that they, that they want to seek? Um, you know, should universities be sending around emails saying, "Are you doing podcasts?" Or um, you know, should we? You know, I, I don't know. How how do we make sure that, that anything that we that we come up with from experience or or thought through knowledge actually is re easily accessible so that people can find it and then not get caught out by not knowing that something that they were supposed to do was was there in the first place? I wonder. I mean, that's a very good question. Um, as a side note, part of my day job at the university is working with EDI or DEI, maybe you do in the States. Um, but there are so many EDI like committees in every school and they don't all talk to each other for some reason. And it seems to be the same with podcasting, like lots of different departments and faculties like have their own podcasting. And then the university as a whole has a channel. Who knew? Um, but no one is talking to each other. So I think, yeah, if it could even start within institutions, if people could like have a hub or something where people could go to, I think that would be great. And then how do we do that nationally and internationally? I guess it'll depend on if organizations like the HPN want to like add something to their website or something. But yeah, I think we live in a world that the internet is so large and the bureaucracy is so I thick. Um, that, um, yeah, I don't think there's an easy answer to having one place that is accessible to everyone. I think you can always just do the best that you can. Um, and so it's it's really easy to think in the digital age where it seems like every like there are particular people that have lots of money then so they're able to reach everyone that we should all be able to do this too. And that's just not reasonable. Um, the the real the real thought is I think like you can look, think about the previous pre-digital ages before we were all in this kind of like much more interconnected thing uh, most people did conferences and i think that is actually a really good thing to do because then you also update your principles you do a conference and you vote and you ratify and you make it an interpersonal intercommunal kind of thing um and then also that that i think also helps address the question that it's like oh man i just got into podcasting and i didn't know that you shouldn't um Re reorder people's words to make them say things that they didn't say um oh darn it um and it's like oh well it's okay now you can come to the conference and if you think that you can vote that principle down if you want and have your voice heard um and that's i think as close to enforcement within professional societies as you can get where unlike say medical professional societies where there's obviously other kinds of repercussions that happen because of the sensitivity of the information or the seriousness of what happens if you mess up kind of stuff um, podcasting is it's a lot less, you know, 
it's more it's more oopsies um, than anything. So uh, I, I think the invitation to join and to be a part of it as best you can is is really just the best that you can do and and the best that you can reach. And maybe you were in the NEH grant session earlier just before this. Uh, and maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's how, how we also help and like get more money to advertise and put on more web pages and uh, blogs or something like that. But a, a working committee and and a, and a conference and a thing I think are the the ways to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, I just saw Rebecca in the chat said that your former university is taking equity out of DEI, which is very concerning. Well, we will not dwell on that for the moment. Uh, Sebastian says, I resonate with Elena's comment of departments not talking to each other here at the University of Central Florida. There are several departments producing podcasts, including ours, the history department, and we would all greatly benefit if we shared institutionalized our knowledge regarding guidelines, best practices, et cetera, for podcasting. Yes, I have submitted so far two grant applications that have been denied that <laughs> included as part of one of my work packages to create a podcasting hub where we could have these guidelines kind of put into like legacy protocol so that when the interested podcasters leave the university or don't have time to podcast anymore, we don't lose all of that cultural knowledge within podcasting. Um, and also to your point, Nick, about um, yeah, the, the oopsies of like the stakes maybe are not so high. I think in general, a lot of institutions and universities are very risk averse and they might be like, oh no, this is so dangerous. What if you speak to an autistic person and they don't like it <laughs> or something? And you're like, okay, but at some point, uh, you have to treat people as consenting adults in like when you're talking to adults, obviously. Um, and I've actually seen modeled in non-academic podcasts, very good ways of kind of what we would call retractions of saying, hey, I acknowledge like what I said last episode was not okay. Or like people reached out to me and said like, this is actually really damaging. Um, and they'll do that on air and so in some cases they'll bring on like someone else um who can maybe speak more to that community from, from where the concern was raised and they will like model kind of learning on air and platforming someone else so i think that's actually something really rich uh that when we are talking about guidelines and like professionalism i always like my hackles go up a little bit because i'm maybe this is me i'm only i'm speaking only for myself here um i'm first and foremost accountable to my audience which is in my case disabled people and disabled academics and so for me if one of them reaches out to me and says like this is harmful or have you thought about it this way it's much more important for me to say that up front as opposed to try and prepare a podcast that will try not to offend anyone and like then I would never do anything it would never go out um and so it's part of these ethical considerations or else so yes prepare to the best of your ability do think about your aims about your ethical structures but also the other half is how do you respond when people come to you and I really like what the Amplify podcast network is doing in Canada where as part of their kind of peer reviewed podcasting system, they take into account how the audience interacted with like the first season of a podcast. So yes, they have other academics who are going through it, but they also take into account like how the audience took the podcast. And not to say that you should, you know, pander or you just change your content because of the audience, but it is an important part of the medium that you're actually reaching other people and they have in most cases the opportunity to get back to you either by email or social media or something like that so yeah i think it is we there are lessons that we can take from kind of the more mainstream podcasting experience just as a as a as a bit of a meta question 
as academics, I am very interested in, in when I'm doing narrative medicine about why people tell the stories that they do and the claims that they make when they tell their stories and the points of those stories. And so for me, it would be very interesting sometimes to take a selection of medical podcasts and examine the nature and the claims and the reasons for doing them. Now, that would be research, and I would automatically go for research ethics. But then who... For work that's already out there in the public domain, should we, you know, who who can, in, is there any right of consent for the podcast owners or hosts around, um, uh, around, uh, you know, whether or not, um, you know, whether or not there should be an element of consent that your podcast can be included in such an analysis? <laughs> I think that's an interesting and difficult question. We have a question in the chat for you, Ian. Have you seen a boom in medical podcasts since the pandemic? Gosh, I haven't done analy- I haven't analyzed it except that I think the answer is probably yes, in the sense that you know it's become a growing medium for people to tell their stories. And that's one of the lovely things about it, isn't it? Is that you get is that you get your voice heard and it can increase social justice by so doing. Um but I I I would I would I haven't quantified it, but my instinct is yes. Yeah, I don't have the metrics, but I did research what podcasts were out there before putting out Massively Disabled, and I did find some really excellent ones uh, by epidemiologists, but also other kinds of doctors and uh, historians of medicine did some really great work as well. Rebecca is saying, speaking of medical podcasts with tricky issues around consent and harm, the retrievals was a major influence on my thinking about podcasts in the past year. Would you be able to tell us what the retrievals are, Rebecca? Sure. This was a podcast that was part of the same network that does Serial and New York Times podcasts. It's about the fact that there were over 200 women over the past decade at Yale New Haven Health Hospitals who were going in for egg retrievals, like um, if they were having difficulty with fertility. And they were not given any kind of anesthetic. They were told that it was an anesthetic, but one of the nurses had been siphoning off um, the, the treatment that was normally being given. And so there's now a pretty massive but low key lawsuit and court trial that's underway. And so it's covering the suffering and harm that was done to these women. And it's choosing sort of when do you anonymize and when do you not? When do you use the person's real voice? When do you use the voice actor? Um, How much of the court hearing audio are you using? But to what degree do you have to consider the privacy rights of the nurse who did this um, in addition? So I thought it was a really tricky unusual situation, but a really compelling listening, listen, and one that gave me a lot to think about in terms of ethics and podcasting. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Maybe I'll add that to my queue. <laughs> I'm just conscious of time. Does anyone have any final questions that you would like to put to us? Uh, Eddie, yes, please share your opinion about broadcasting. Um, thank you. Um, I'm from Hong Kong, although now I'm in UK. Um, we have a good practice during um, the civil war uh, since past 10 years in Hong Kong. And then we notice it when people broadcasting and share the news or share their journalists that they are lively video the things or uh, discuss the issue. I'm really amazed that people can using the broadcasting not only at that moment, people continue to read it and send it out. So it's very practical, I think. Um, also, it would be a very good platform when people want to know the truth because so many fake news. Um, so I'm amazed that when I heard you mention it in the university in the UK, is a lot of platform and practice before people using broadcasting. So um, in Hong Kong, we also have academic uh, topic that people from um, college, from the university, they are lecturer or they are student. They will discuss the different topic academically, but they were very 
simple wording and let people know it and comprehend those no matter the political issue or uh, the social issue. So um, I think it's a lot of uh, things to continue and develop and using it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's our time. So I would like to thank Dieter and Ian for joining me and Rebecca for facilitating the Zoom and everyone here who came to listen and I hope you got something out of it.